I welcome you to the 2022 Franciscan Zoom Lectures hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Father Robert J. Karras, OFM, graduated from Catholic University of America with an STL and from Harvard University with a THD in New Testament, that's T as in theology. He is a past president of the Catholic Biblical Association. His most significant publications are Prayer and the New Testament, published in 2000, the annotated translation of St. Bonaventure's commentary on Luke's gospel in three volumes, published in the years 2001 through 2003, Eating Your Way Through Luke's Gospel, published in 2006, The Admonitions of St. Francis, Sources and Meetings, the second edition of which was published in 2015. Cardinal Hugh of St. Cher's commentary on Jesus's parable of Dives and Lazarus. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31, which was published in 2021. He preaches 42 weekends of the year to raise money for those in dire poverty who are served by the Food for the Poor organization. I welcome Father Karras. Well, thank you very much. The title, as you see there, is Luke 10, 30 to 35. St. Francis of Assisi and St. Bonaventure team up with an impulsively generous Samaritan and a scorned lady innkeeper to save a half-dead bloke. We'll come back to this title in various ways, but... That is what it is, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Let me start off with what I call the Franciscan Preludes. St. Francis of Assisi delivered 28 admonitions. Many of them are very tiny, like this one, admonition 24 on true love. Blessed is the servant who would love his brother as much when he is infirm and unable to be of use to him as when that brother is healthy and of use to him. Come into admonition 24 in the parable of the compassionate Samaritan is care or love for someone who is sick and of no use. If I ever get around to publish the third edition of my book on Francis's admonitions, I should add Luke 10, 30 to 35 as a potential parallel. But perhaps more important for our purposes is St. Bonaventure's commentary on Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 35. I want to spend a little time with this. Almost everything in the parable has a meaning in this allegorical commentary. Just look at it. The person in need is the human race, went from paradise into the world. The robbers are the power of the demons. The priest, the law, or hardness of heart. The Levite is the prophets, or avarice. The Samaritan is Christ the Lord. Oil and vine are the sacraments. The pack animal, gifts and graces of the virtues. The inn is the church. Tudarni are the teachings of the two testaments. The innkeeper is a prelate who is responsible for administering the church's teachings. Now, obviously, I mean, at least it's obvious to me then you have to have some understanding outside that parable to get all these interpretations. I don't think of any scholar today would use such an allegorical interpretation, but perhaps if you go on Google, you find that some preachers do. I'm amazed what I find on Google. Also notice Bonaventure's anti-Jewish stance. And that's so often found in contemporary commentaries. As I'll, we'll see later on, we got priest, Levite, and it should be layperson. But we in our Christian tradition have very often taken that to mean it's the Jewish religion, et cetera, et cetera. Notice too that the innkeeper counts. Note also that the innkeeper is a prelate. I asked the question, would Bonaventure have made this in the, in, 
identification to be new that in antiquity, innkeepers were women. Again, we'll see that later on. In sum, beware of anti-Jewish bias. The innkeeper is not a throwaway character. And in, in, in anticipation, innkeepers in antiquity were generally women. Bonaventure has taught us quite a few things. We don't want to do the allegorical, but he's told us, let's take a look at these individuals. The innkeeper, for example, does count. My introduction to my approach to this parable is not to give you the one and only interpretation. Rather, I want to give information for your imagination to appreciate Luke 10, 30 to 35 as a parable of God's kingdom. Now, how do I do this? There are six exorcisms. I'm of such a vintage that I'm an ordained exorcist. I have seven sidebars. Isn't this the scholarly thing to do these days? And it's mentioning these two items. I have to say, I've tried to be contemporary by having PowerPoint and sidebars, but I go back to the old fashioned way that repetition is the parent of information of learning. And finally, I have a citation from a Jewish document contemporary with Luke's gospel that tells a story as parallels to our particular parable. And when we get that, we're gonna spend quite a bit of that. Six demons that impede creative and life enhancing interpretations. I think what we have to do is acknowledge that our demons feed the mindset that we've always interpreted this parable in this way. It's Imber Sogevason, the root province of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, go back to Germany. We know very much the tradition of, we've always done it this way. It goes even back to the day of creation. It's hard to open our minds to pick up something new. I think we'll find that with regard to this parable and probably all the parables. The first demon Expel the word good from the title of the parable. It is nowhere found in the biblical text. Samaritans are not nice guys. I look at the title, which are not part of the Bible, part of Bible text of the New American Bible Revised Version. It has the parable of the Good Samaritan. The New Revised Standard Version has, it is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We often use the terminology, the Good Samaritan did this, the Good Samaritan did that. Samaritans, as we'll see, and you know yourself, are not nice guys. Demon one. The second demon stems from Luke himself, who turns the parable into an example story. See verse 37. Go and do likewise. Or the question is asked, which of these three was neighbor. I suppose what I'm going to be arguing, which of these four is neighbor? But what if Jesus's words by themselves, without Luke's interpretation, are a genuine parable about the kingdom of God, which is like these events? Demon number two. Demon number three. Recall contemporary Roman Catholic studies, Sidoris. There was a Jesuit a Dominican and a Franciscan. The story I remember, Jesuits are before God, and they ask God, do you know how many schools we have? And God says, oh, that's an easy one. I know how many schools you have. The Dominicans pipe up and say, well, how much money have we got? Just, Come on, give me something that's hard. I know how much money you got. Everybody knows that. The Franciscan then says, well, how many Franciscans are there? And God looks at the angels and looks around and I don't know that. Who knows how many different religious congregations and orders refer to themselves as Franciscan? It's a set story with three. Change that into Franciscan, Dominican, and atheist. And I think we begin to sample what Jesus has done in this parable. Or, 
as Amy Gio Levine puts it in her commentary on Luke's gospel, how about father, son, and Satan? The storyline is priest, Levite, layperson. Jesus dynamites this trio by saying Samaritan. Even though this is still brought in, in the most recent commentary I've seen, the priest and Levite were not going to the temple for sacred work. They were coming from the temple, and therefore they were not going to contaminate themselves, become unholy by touching what they might presume to be a corpse. Third demon, common understanding of meaning of priest and Levite. We move to the fourth demon. Fourth demon is our common experience of inns. Don't smother Jesus' story with our own contemporary, largely positive experience of inns and innkeepers. We'll see more about this in sidebar five. When I first started work for Food for the Poor, I was headquartered at St. Bonaventure University, an hour and a half south of the Buffalo Airport, which was my primary airport. There were many inns and motels around there. I became very familiar with the choice slate of inns. I always knew I would have heat or air conditioning. The hot water would work. I'd have shampoo and I'd have soap. The managers were hospitable, very courteous, helpful. I didn't have to worry about being mugged or being robbed. Even got some food free, the breakfasts especially. Didn't have to worry about bug bugs. Talking of bug bugs, allow me to bring in from one of my major resources, Lionel Casson's book, Travel in the Ancient World, his summary from the Acts of John, that's the Apostle John. The apocryphal Acts of John tells a story of how the Apostle dealt with these nuisances, namely the bedbugs, during a trip he took from Laodicea to Ephesus. He and his companions spent the night in an abandoned inn, Perhaps it had been abandoned for the very reason that the beg bug population had increased beyond the tolerance point. Because during the night, John, who had been given the only bed, was heard to call out, I say unto you, O bugs, behave yourselves. What all? Leave your abode for this one night and remain quiet in one place and keep your distance from the servants of God. The companions who stretched out on the floor were spared the problem, and they giggled at their leader's discomfort. Yet thereafter, the apostles slept in utter peace. And the next morning, they found all the bugs dutifully lined up outside the front door. Do not try to bring your own, my own experience of ends into the story. As they say, we will smother the story and perhaps lose some of its meaning. The fifth demon is another contemporary experience. That is our experience and expectation of healthcare. Whatever healthcare there was in Luke's day, it was largely unavailable to ordinary people. Home remedies, even something like chicken noodle soup, and bed rest ruled the medical field. We have to get out of our heads. For example, here living in downtown Chicago, I go can walk maybe 15 minutes and be in urgent care, walk 20 minutes and be in the Northwest Memorial Hospital. Even go to Walgreens during the pharmacy hours and get some assistance. There was nothing like that in antiquity at the time of Luke. We ask ourselves then, what care was the innkeeper supposed to give to the half dead person? Our sixth demon. 
is the common interpretation left us by commentators and preachers alike that the innkeeper is insignificant. Remember that there are six characters in the parable. Could one person reasonably succeed in bringing the half dead person back to health? As I have found with other parables in Luke's gospel, we have a very infirm homiletic tradition of dealing with the innkeeper. I would ask you, have you ever heard any sermon on Luke 10, 30 to 35, that mentioned the innkeeper in any significant way. Conclusion, perhaps you have other conclusions. We have a lot of exercising to do. I think that such liberating activity is far more strenuous than exercising physically. But think of how fit and trim we'll feel. Sidebars, there's seven. And as I said at the beginning, my method of learning is repetition. The journey from Jerusalem to Jericho is 17 miles downhill. It's arduous, dangerous. One goes from 2,500 feet above sea level to about 800 feet below sea level. Now you know why so many Psalms talk about going up to Jerusalem. Again, the Levite and the priests were not going up to Jerusalem. They were coming down from their worship to where a number of priests live, namely in Jericho. Samaritans. I'm not going to talk about the history of relationship between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. Look at Luke's gospel itself. This parable occurs after the apostles want to have fire rain down upon the inhospitable Samaritans. In Luke 17, 11 to 19, the gospel read on the Feast of Thanksgiving, we have the only one to return of the 10 lepers is the Samaritan. And Jesus refers to him, Jesus himself refers to him as a foreigner, not one of us. John's gospel. Chapter 4, the, the Samaritan woman, pardon my misspelling mistake, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, how can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. And most powerful in chapter 8, verse 48, here the Jews give voice to their weightiest argument against Jesus, he is an other. He's not one of us. He's one of them. He's a Samaritan. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and possessed? Samaritans are not nice guys. Perhaps you and I have rarely looked at these 12 rapid actions of the Samaritan. I use the New American Bible revised translation. He came near, saw, was moved by compassion, went, bandaged, poured on, put, brought, took care of him, took two denarii, gave to innkeeper, said to innkeeper, is this not impulsive behavior, irrational action? But Luke's Hellenistic readers frown on such conduct. And besides, we ask the question, could the robbers who left the man half dead be just lying in wait, ready to grab a hold of the Samaritan? I conclude this thought with the observation. Remember that in Galatians 5.23, self-control, in gratia, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Sidebar three. Sidebar four leads us into an area where it's hard to get unanimity. The purchasing power of two denarii. Depends on the criteria. Douglas Oakman says two meals daily for adult male for 24 days. 
he weighs the number of calories in the food and the purchasing power of a denarius to buy those calories. Arlen Holmgren, who writes one of the most popular commentaries on all the parables, says food, lodging, and service for well over a week or two. I ask him, where does he get this for a week or two? What I do, I follow a tale from Lionel Casson and come up with little less than three days. Mind you that 10 Roman bronze coins equals one denarius. Casson found this on a plaque. Guest, innkeeper, let's reckon up the bill. Female innkeeper, one pint of wine and bread, one bronze coin. Food, two bronze coins. The guest says, that's right. Innkeeper, woman and room, namely a prostitute in a room, eight bronze coins. Guest, correct again. Hey for the mule, two bronze coins. That mule will be the death of me. If we subtract the hay for the mule, if we subtract, take the woman out of the room and say four bronze coins, we are down now from six, six from 13, we have seven. That's how I get a little less than three days, the purchasing power of the two denarii. The inn chosen by the Samaritan. Generally, inns for ordinary people, that is none military and none rich, were of two types, hospitium or capona. The first might include a prostitute. The latter was definitely low class. I suggest again, independence on Casson and then an earth in Pompeii, which I call Hospitium Plus. He went around their ground floor, which faces the street. There is an antechamber flanked on either side by modest sized rooms for kitchen, restaurant and reception. Tucked in the corner is the latrine. Go through the antechamber and you come out in the back where there is a courtyard for wagons and animals. Some 12 bedrooms were available primarily on the second floor. Something startling to me is our sixth sidebar. Innkeepers were generally women. Again, Cass on page 204, as far back as the earliest days of travel, innkeeping was often a woman's job, and this continued right into Roman times. I ask you, please remember this when we investigate below the Jewish parallel from the Mishnah. Jesus, the 12 and the 72 disciples and Paul didn't stay at inns. Luke Acts gives us very little help about inns. Jesus, his apostles, disciples, and Paul did not stay at inns. They stayed with the families or Christian households. Recall Lydia in Acts 16. In Acts 28, 30, Paul, a prisoner, stays in rented quarters. We get little help from Luke chapter 2, verse 7, which describes Jesus' birth in his stable. Nor does the upper room in Luke 22 or Acts 1 help. Maybe we should think especially about Jesus' birth of the Hospitium Plus. Now here's my outside resource. You might say it's what New Testament scholars do. They try to find a parallel from contemporary documents or sources to what we are investigating. The Mishnah, we're talking about something that's around 200 of the common era. And the Yebamoth is the brother's widow. This text, I'm going to take it one way. The text is going another way. Rabbi Akiva is the dominant figure in the post-temple period. His opinion is mighty. The sages have to argue against him. And they do it on a number of levels, and we'll see it here. 
But as they are arguing, there is also the story about the inn, a female innkeeper, who is presented here definitely of low status, but seems to be quite honest. She produces their companion staff traveling bag and the Torah scroll he had had in hand. Let's read it very carefully. Rabbi Akiva says, not on the evidence of a woman, not on the evidence of a slave, nor on the evidence of a slave girl, or on the evidence of relatives, and I put there, can we declare that the man died and his wife is free to remarry. The sages said to Rabbi Akiva, the story is told that certain Levites went to Zoar, the town famous for dates, and one of them took sick on the way, and they left him at an inn. Upon their return, they said to the female innkeeper, where is our friend? She said to them, he died and I buried him. And they permitted his wife to remarry on the strength of her evidence. They said to him, and should not a well-bred woman, literally woman of priestly descent, be equivalent to an innkeeper? He said to them, were that woman the innkeeper, she should be believed. The innkeeper had produced for them his staff, traveling bag, and the Torah scroll he had had in hand. If you want to read this tractate yourself, maybe in the different context, it's simple to Google the tractate Yabamoth 16. What points do we draw from this most illuminating parallel from 90 common era? First, the discussion is under what conditions the deceased man's wife may remarry. Second, along the way, we meet a female innkeeper who, although on the lowest rung of the social ladder, seems honest. We also encounter a Levite who is literally sick unto death. When he dies, the innkeeper buries him. It seems implied that the innkeeper did what she could to keep the ailing Levite alive. Third, Note that there is no mention of the innkeeper's religion. Also, there is no mention of money for the innkeeper so that she may care for the sick Levi. Perhaps you're drawing even more points from this most illuminating parallel. In conclusion, remember, I did not want to open your skulls and pour in information. I wanted to give sidebars. I wanted to do some exorcisms so that your imagination would be free to deal with this parable. And I define a parable using Charles Harold Dodd's definition, which you find very often in parable commentaries. At its simplest, a parable is a metaphor or simile drawn from nature or common life, arresting the hearer by its vividness or strangeness and leaving the mind in sufficient doubt about its application to tease it into active thought. I have underlined common life, strangeness, teasing. Perhaps it wasn't that common, people to stay in inns, but the strangeness of this girl, what the Samaritan, that it is a Samaritan, and what he does seems quite strange. And we have to allow ourselves to not think, well, it's two by two or two plus two equals four. We allow our minds, our imaginations to be teased, be active, to think. Second, and I know this is repetitious, Let's enumerate the characters in this parable again. Robbers, person left half dead, priest, Levite, Samaritan, and keeper. That's six characters, right? My third point, 
Third, are these characters similar to some of the characters in other Lucan parables? The indulgent father with two sons, miserable Lazarus and the rich six brothers. How is the kingdom of God like the relationships between these characters? Has expository and especially homiletic interpretation forgotten about the elder son and the five brothers and the innkeeper? Remember the demon of you, we, I have always read this parable this way. Why should we try to do something else? If it ain't broken, let's unfix it. Yeah. Can we have different insights? We preachers of the gospel, we preachers of the parables. Again, I ask. The parable of the prodigal son is very popular, especially during Lent. How often have you heard about the second son, the elder son? We don't use Lazarus and the six brothers too often in the liturgy, but it's usually miserable Lazarus and the rich man. What about the five brothers who don't even bother with the law and the prophets? Honey, I ask, do the Samaritan and the innkeeper live up to listeners' expectations or biases? Isn't the Samaritan known for his unfriendliness to Jews? Are an innkeepers scorned for their low status on the social ladder? That is, are they expected to help? Don't we expect God's kingdom to come among us in the tried and true ways of our faith and its practices? They may worship in the temple, sacraments, preaching, the good example of clergy, religious, lay people, our parents. Yet here is others who don't fit our pertinent information and who point out what is strange in this parable so that we might be teased to explore it afresh. As I say this, I acknowledge that I have tilted my exegesis in a certain way, but he knew that from the very beginning. Then you notice the title. May God continue to grant you and me good health, insight, and especially a lively, faith-filled imagination. May God bless and keep you. May he shine his face upon you and give you great peace, health, and a vivid and faithful imagination. Buona notte.